Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another one of the COVID-19 webinars uh, brought to you by the National Institute for Occupational Health, the NIOH. Um, this, I believe, is our 97th webinar since March 2020, and we have reached over 50,000 participants and attendees in the uh, webinar series. Um, today's webinar series, I think, is of absolute great importance and of great interest to the stakeholder audience of the NIOH. And um, I just note that uh, the IT colleagues, um, Tabani and Glenn has indicated that we've had a bumper registration for this uh, session, over 1,600 people that have registered. Um, however, our webinar platform can only accommodate a maximum of 1,000 attendees logged in. And after that, uh, once people can't join after the 1,000, we will be encouraging them to uh, go to the live YouTube streaming of this webinar. Um, and to the question asked by one of our attendees in the question and answer box, um, if I can quickly just pop that up again, I had to move it. Um, so uh, to, it was, um, apologies, Anneli Wickham. Um, yes, the session is being recorded and all recordings, audio, video and presentations of the presenters will be shared via link uploaded to our website, which is zero rated. Okay, so that's just getting that quickly out of the way, Anneli. And um, uh, a bit of quick um, admin. Uh, do not use the question and answer box. That's Annalise, Susan, and Shalmay for, oh, sorry, not Susan, for asking questions about admin, CPD points, certificates, and so on and so on. Um, that you must use the chat box. Um, chat box is for general administration, as well as for any questions you have related to aspects of CPD certificates and recordings and so on. Um, I'm going to encourage you to use the question and answer box, the Q&A box, to ask questions all of your questions, no questions in the chat box, all your questions in the question answer box for our presenters, and they will be um, uh, encouraged and asked to just answer your questions there in the question answer box. We also have a, a, pan, a number of panelists from the occupational medicine section here at the NIH, um, led by Dr. Nompumalelo Ndaba, who will be answering those questions for you there. 
uh, their raised hand function is not valid for such a large number of attendees and participants. So I'm going to ask you not to uh, use the raised hand function, but to type your questions in the um, question and answer box or general aspects in the chat box. So Zanele Gwenya, if you could just lower your hand, that would be much appreciated. So just for the formal start, um, greetings, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome, as I said, to another uh, webinar in the COVID-19 series brought to you by the National Institute of Occup Occupational Health. The NIH is a specialized division of the National Health Laboratory Services, the NHLS. And um, so we're delighted to have you here on this particular topic of COVID-19 vaccines and the workplace. And we've got three distinguished guests who's going to share uh, the presentations, thoughts, experience, and expertise with you, and as well as answer your questions in the question answer box. And towards the end, we'll have a Q&A session uh, to focus on the key questions asked, the key observations that our speakers and our presenters have uh, made, not just from your questions, but from the different contributions they've made. And we will engage in that last session. So um, the, on the topic of COVID-19 vaccine safety, we've got uh, Dr. Desiki Kalonji. Um, and uh, Dr. Kalonji will deal with that particular topic. A second after that will be followed by COVID-19 workplace vaccination programs. Um, and that's dealt with by Dr. Yamanya Tembo. Uh, both, uh, and thirdly, finally, on COVID-19 vaccine update. Um, and I'm sure a lot of us are looking forward to this as well by Professor Shabir Madi um, from WITS. So without um, further ado, I'm going to ask, I just want to check if uh, Dr. Singh is with us. Um, I've now unfortunately forgotten to just check um, if she's here with us. Um, so it doesn't seem like it is the case. I'm therefore going to ask Dr. Nompobelelo Ndaba, and this is off the cuff, just to do a welcome in the absence of Dr. Singh. Uh, uh, Dr. Tanisha Singh is the head of our um, COVID-19 committee here known as the COVID-19 um, Occupational Outbreak Response Team, the OO team. And um, unfortunately, she's not in a position now to assist us today. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Naba, as the head of the Occupational Medicine section, just to say a few words um, of, of welcome. Over to you, Dr. Naba. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, on behalf of the NIH, uh, OHOT, uh, the uh, task team and on behalf of the occupational medicine section we welcome you uh, to this webinar we know it's long been requested we have long been thinking we are going to host this special welcome welcome to our guest speakers today and the presenters we are hoping to gain a lot from today's presentation and we also have panelists who are going to be assisting us with questions and we, we hope to have fun and learn from this and special welcome to Professor Shabir Mahdi and the other speakers um, really for making time in their very busy schedule and prioritizing us at this time. Thank you, welcome on board, thanks. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Ndaba, um, for rescuing me there for a moment, at a moment. So without further um, uh, de uh, more details on this, I'm going to quickly um, bring up the PowerPoint slide in order to introduce our first speaker uh, by way of introduction and to ask her just to prepare to share her slides and to um, open her microphone, um, Dr. Kolonji. So um, just to quickly share this particular slide, one moment. Um, there we go. So I'm not always good at the slide sharing, uh, but I hope that that's visible to you. Um, maximized um, just a little bit. Okay, so by way of introduction, Dr. Desigik Jenny Kalonji is a qualified medical doctor with additional specializations and an MED at, from the University of KwaZulu Natal. She's a clinical research site leader at the Isipingo Research Site, uh, the HIDRU SAMRC in Durban. That's the South African Medical Research Council. Dr. Kalonji is also a principal investigator for two HIV prevention trials, um, one PrEP and one HIV vaccine, vaccine and two COVID-19 trials, 
uh, the COVPN 3008 and Sisonki 4. As the CRS leader, Dr. Golongi have oversight of all studies at the site. Isipingo CRS is experienced in all phases of clinical trials, phase one to four. The site is experienced with both HIV vaccine and SARS-CoV-2 vaccine trials and vaccine safety. As a principal investigator, vaccine safety is her bread and butter. And with that very short introduction, I ask uh, Dr. Kalonji uh, to join us and share her presentation slides. A quick admin reminder while that's happening to all of our attendees, um, please type your questions. That's questions related to the presentations and the subject matter of our speakers and presenters in the Q&A box. No admin in the Q&A box. All admin related matters is for the chat box. We will monitor that and we want to focus mainly on the questions that is happening in the chat box. To Bulewa and others, please do not raise your hands. You will not be allowed to open your microphone. Thank you very much. And over to you, Dr. Kalonji. I see your my, um, slides are maximized. And um, just to check, your microphone is open. I hand over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the invite. So my name is Dr. Tishiki Jenikalonji, and as seen in my bio sketch, um, so yes, so I'm pretty much a principal investigator, and so vaccine safety is um, quite important in my line of work. So I'm just apologies going to for interrupting, Dr. Kalonji. Could you just yes. move closer to your microphone? Thank you. Can you hear me better now? It sounds a little bit better. Thanks. All right, okay. So I'm gonna go straight into my presentation, thank you. So the content of my presentation includes um, vaccine safety, then we'll talk about some adverse events, vaccine safety in immunization programs, pre-licensure vaccine safety, post-licensure vaccine safety, and also a little bit on vaccine safety regulations. So vaccine safety is actually defined as a process um, that maintains the highest efficacy of and lowest adverse reaction to a vaccine by addressing its production, storage, and handling. Vaccine safety is part of, an, of immunization safety. And as you know, with all medicines, every vaccine needs to go through extensive and rigorous testing before it can be introduced in a country. Once they are in use, vaccines must be continuously monitored to make sure they are safe for the people who receive them. And it can be classified as pre-licensure and post-licensure. Just to discuss some expectations towards safety of vaccines, vaccines are not completely risk-free. Adverse events do occur. Thank goodness most adverse events are actually minor, such as redness, like injection site or fever. There are more serious reactions, but these are uncommon and sometimes very rare. And these include seizures and anaphylaxis. The general public has a very low tolerance to any adverse events following vaccination. And simply because vaccines are given to healthy persons to prevent disease, so a higher standard of safety is expected of immunizations compared to medication that are used to as treatment. There is a greater need to detect and investigate any adverse event following immunization than is generally expected for other pharmaceutical products. And this is just a diagram to kind of show that the how the public has a low public tolerance and therefore it is a very important responsibility of national regulatory authorities to ensure with rigor the quality, safety and effectiveness of vaccines and pharmaceutical products. Now just a little bit about adverse events. So an adverse event following immunization is any untoward medical occurrence which follows immunization it does not necessarily have a causal relationship with the usage of the vaccine. So we describe them as related or unrelated. And these can actually be divided in five categories. There are vaccine product related reactions, which is actually due to inherent properties of the vaccine product. There are immunization error related reactions, which is caused by inappropriate vaccine handling, prescribing or administration. Then you've got vaccine quality defect related reactions, which is due to any, any quality defects of the product. 
There's immunization, anxiety-related reactions, and that arises from anxiety about the immunization and the process and the theory of injections. There are also what we call coincidental events, which is any event that happens after the vaccination but is not caused by the vaccine or the vaccination process. And all of these different kinds of adverse events following immunization have implications when it comes to COVID-19. Causes of adverse events, um, vaccines contain different components to make them effective. And technically speaking, each component in a vaccine adds a potential risk of an adverse reaction. Regulatory authority must ensure that all vaccine components, singly or and in combination, do not compromise vaccine safety. It's also prepared with different types of antigens, using different scientific methods, such as inactivation, attenuation. In addition, some vaccines include components to enhance the immune response, such as adjuvants and conjugated proteins. And vaccine can also include antibiotics and stabilizers to reduce contamination during the manufacturing process. And for this reason, manufacturers usually recommend the route of administration that limits best adverse reactions of the respective vaccine. Under ideal conditions, vaccines should cause no adverse events and completely prevent the infection that they target. Then again, this is an ideal situation and it does not exactly happen. The key therefore is to minimize as much as possible adverse events and ensure a safe use of vaccines. So this is just a table um, outlining the different kind of adverse events and how common and how frequent they are. So for example, you've got very common, which has normally some local um, adverse events, then there are are some that are uncommon and some that are rare and some that are very, very rare. When it comes to COVID-19 va COVID vaccines, common side effects um, happen locally, for example, pain, redness, and swelling at the site of injection. And then there are also some systemic um, adverse events such as tiredness, headache, muscle pains, fever, nausea. There's another special group of adverse events that we call adverse events of special interest. And this is a pre-identified and pre-defined medically significant event that has the potential to be causally associated with a vaccine product. And this needs to be carefully monitored and confirmed by further specific studies. And we call them short AESIs. Here's a table of AESIs specific to COVID-19. Um, as you can see there, it includes coagulation disorders, I'm sure. You're all aware of the extensive media coverage uh, regarding coagulation disorders and um, defects that came along with COVID-19 vaccines. Now, there's, there needs to be a balance between efficacy and safety. So vaccine efficacy refers to the ability of a vaccine to bring about its intended beneficial effects on vaccinated individuals, and of course, in a defined population and under ideal conditions of use, which is why in clinical trials, we talk about efficacy and post-marketing, we tend to call, we tend to discuss effectiveness once it is in the market. So the potential benefits of an effective vaccine must actually be weighed against the potential risk of an adverse event following immunization. Vaccine associated risk is the probability of an adverse or an unwanted outcome occurring and the severity of the resulting harm to the health of the vaccinated individuals in a defined population and again, under ideal conditions of use. An important criterion for vaccine safety that regulatory authorities must establish is this risk benefit assessment of immunization with a particular vaccine in a defined population. Public confidence in vaccine safety is increased by clear communication of this risk benefit assessments, comparing the very low vaccine associated risk with the very significant benefits of vaccination. So the greater the gap, the better. Risk benefit assessments should be applied to most situations relating to the efficacy or safety of vaccines to ensure public safety and public health. Now, there is a special scenario I just wanted to discuss, which is vaccine safety in immunization programs. 
there is a graph that will um, follow. Um, so I just want you to imagine different stages. There is a pre-vaccine era, for example, and in a pre-vaccine era, you have a new infectious disease, like for example, SARS-CoV-2, and it results in high incidence of disease, high morbidity, high mortality at times. And at the time before the vaccine, there is no vaccine, and therefore there's also no adverse events. And this pre-vaccine stage is, can be considered as a stage one, the phase before a vaccine is introduced. In stage two, an effective vaccine is introduced to prevent a particular disease. And then there is an increase in immunization uptake and therefore a decrease in disease incidence. But at the same time, there's a new vaccine and therefore there's an increase in adverse events following immunization, whether it's real or perceived. Paradoxically, it is just when vaccine benefits are most apparent and vaccine coverage is at its highest that vaccine safety concerns are also most likely to increase in the general public. So now there's an increased focus on adverse events following immunization. And this is often, and you have seen it with COVID-19, intensified by media coverage of one or a few case reports. And this can lead to a loss of confidence in the vaccine by the public and also a reduction in vaccine coverage. So the more successful a vaccination campaign is, the less visible the prevented disease may become to the public. And as the threat of the original disease vanishes in the perception of the public, the attention is mainly focused on adverse events of the vaccine. And then it can lead to a distorted perception of the risk of the vaccines and also a negligence of the much greater health threat by the original disease, which may lead to decreased acceptance of the vaccine. And this leads us to stage three, which is a resurgence of the disease to higher or sometimes even epidemic levels. And this resurgence of the disease or an introduction of another alternative vaccine can result in renewed public acceptance of vaccination against the disease. And this leads to stage four where vaccination levels increase and the disease is reduced to earlier low levels. And if we are lucky for certain vaccine preventable diseases like such as smallpox that can be eradicated, then vaccine use can stop completely and thereby removing any risk of any adverse event resulting from its use. And that would be considered stage five. Now to ensure that the cycle does not repeat, it's very important that any vaccine issue, safety issue requires timely detection, evaluation and response efforts to gain and maintain high public confidence. So this is what the diagram, the graph looks like. You can see stage one pre-vaccine, a lot of disease and little vaccine coverage until a vaccine is introduced. And that would be stage two where you've got increased coverage and the disease incidence decreases. Stage three, you've got loss of confidence. And again, we start, having, we start seeing outbreaks. And with stage four, there's a resumption in confidence. And again, vaccine coverage um, increases and disease incidence decreases further. And if we're lucky and there's a stage five and eradication, then there's no more disease. And at the same time, we can phase out the vaccine. Now we're just gonna discuss pre-licensure vaccine safety and post-licensure vaccine safety. So vaccines undergo extensive testing and review for safety, for immunogenicity and efficacy. It starts in the lab, and then in animals and in three phases of clinical trials in human subjects. And this is before licensure, before it goes onto the market. Monitoring adverse vaccine reaction is a major safety component of pre-licensure clinical trials. In my line of work as principal investigators, this is pretty much what we do the entire day. Now, pre-licensure studies often identify common and acute negative reactions that occur with a frequency greater than one in 10,000 vaccinations. And that really depends on the sample size of the study. But the sensitivity of detection of uncommon and very rare adverse events are those or those with delayed onset is however low in these pre-licensure trials. As a result, continuous post-licensure monitoring of vaccine safety is needed to identify and evaluate such adverse events. So here we go when we talk about the three um, clinic phases 
uh, pre-licensure, there's phase one, and phase one is really looking at um, some safety issues, immunogenicity, tolerability, and it's normally low risk individuals and very, very small studies, like 10 to 100 participants. Phase two looks at safety, potential side effects, again, still looking at immune response, and also looking at optimum dosage and schedule. And again, and there you've got an increased number of participants. Clinical trial phase threes look at effic clinical efficacy in the disease prevention and provide more safety information. Um, and there you have quite, you can have large sample sizes of participants. After this, there's a submission where the vaccine application is submitted to regulatory authorities for approval for the market. And if this is approved, then the vaccine is introduced in society. And before I move on to post licensure, I just want to discuss um, this emergency use listing, which I think you've seen a lot of with these COVID-19 vaccines. So this emergency use listing, it's a unique WHO facilitated regulatory pathway. It can only be used in a declared public health emergency of international concern or other public health emergency designated by the WHO Director General. And this emergency scenario actually allows for a product to be listed while it's still unlicensed based on an earlier package of safety and efficacy data than is the norm. And the first vaccine to actually um, be submitted to the WHO EUL under the revised procedure was oral, the, no, the novel oral polio vaccine type two in 2019, 2020. And this vaccine was developed to better address the evolving risk of type two circulating vaccine derived polio virus. And this was elicited as a declaration of uh, PHEIC by the WHO in 2014. And the EOL actually plays a critical role in accelerating equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, enabling manufacturing countries to use an emergency pathway to authorize products. So the norm for pre-licensure vaccine safety, if you look at the trials, is that you can see that it takes many years, many, many years. If you look at from the beginning to a phase one, three to, three to eight years, from phase one to phase three, two to 10 years, and regulatory review can take one to two years. So it, take, it can take up to 15 years before a vaccine under normal condition reaches the market. But with under the EUL pathway, you can see that all these are reduced to months. So what was taking three to eight years is now two to three months. And then from phase one to phase three, you've got six to 12 months and phase three, three to nine months. And this is this accelerated vaccine development leading to then EUL um, submissions. And you may ask yourself, how do they do it? And the good news is that there are no steps that are skipped, but what happens is that phases are overlapped and this shortens development time. And I can tell you that at a site level, we do feel it. Um, this um, EUL is actually more um, intense and there's a lot of work that goes into it, but this is what happens. So this pandemic paradigm requires multiple activities to be conducted and it is at the financial risk to developers and manufacturers because they may not necessarily know whether the vaccine candidate will be safe and effective. And also it includes very early manufacturing scale up to commercial scale before establishment of necessary clinical proof of concept. But this is how the EUL works. And just to give you a slide that kind of shows of the different vaccines that are in development, you can see that there are many vaccines in preclinical and, and then some are in phase one, phase two, phase three, then um, the number of vaccines that are in use, and then phase four, which we will discuss now as that is part of the post licensure um, safety. So post-licensure vaccine safety, um, this involves post-licensure surveillance of vaccine safety, and it's actually quite critical. The conditions and the reasons for safety monitoring now change following licensure and the introduction of a new vaccine in a country. Vaccines are now in use, as opposed to being under trial conditions, and they're in use in the general population, and recipients are no longer monitored in clinical trials with these narrow inclusion exclusion criteria. And all of a sudden, subpopulations that, were that are commonly excluded in clinical trials 
will get vaccinated. There are large numbers of people are being vaccinated and other factors that can lead to adverse events following immunization, such as incorrect administration practices need to be monitored for safety. Uncommon and rare vaccine reactions are now um, seen and reactions with delayed onset, which are not detected before vaccines are licensed. So now healthcare providers should understand that vaccines can demonstrate rare and potentially serious adverse events in this post-licensure vaccine safety. In these instances, policymaking bodies have actually judged that the individual and community benefits of vaccination outweigh the risks. And there are several surveillance options for post, in post-licensure vaccine safety. And just to define surveillance, so surveillance is this continual system systematic collection of data that are analyzed and disseminated to enable decision-making and action to protect the health of populations. The adverse events following immunization surveillance systems are specific to monitoring adverse events associated with vaccine use. And there are two types. We have passive surveillance systems and there are active surveillance systems. And this is just the surveillance cycle. You can see that the adverse event is detected, then notified, reported, it's investigated, and then there's analysis of data, then there's causality assessment, and then feedback. Now for passive surveillance system, these are actually the very common surveillance systems. They're spontaneous reporting systems. If they're the cornerstone of most post-licensure safety monitoring systems, because they're re relatively easy to implement, their cost and ability to capture unexpected events. You can monitor events reported by healthcare providers and consumers, and they do not actively seek out and collect data or measure outcomes using study protocols. Now, for post-licensure, there are different types. This is post-licensure clinical trials and phase four surveillance studies. And in this case, the vaccines undergo clinical trial to assess the effects of changes in vaccine formulation, vaccine strain, age at vaccination, number and timing of vaccine doses, and also simultaneous administration or interchangeability of vaccines from different manufacturers, for example. And it helps to improve the ability to detect adverse events that are not detected during pre-licensure trials. There are also other surveillance systems such as large linked databases. And these actually, because they enroll populations numbering from thousands to millions, they can detect very rare adverse events. Other ones are such as um, this, the CISA, which is um, in the US, for example, it's tertiary clinical centers that have been used to conduct research on immunization associated health risks. Now, about a little bit about immunization safety surveillance. So immunization safety is the process of ensuring and monitoring the safety of all aspects of immunization. And that includes vaccine quality, adverse events, vaccine storage and handling, administration, disposal of shops and management of waste. The skills and infrastructure to deal with genuine vaccine adverse reactions are essential for to public safety, as well as to prevent or manage fear caused by false or unproven signals from patients and health workers. There's also vaccine pharmacovigilance, and this is defined as a science and activities relating to the detection, assessment, understanding, and communication of adverse events following immunization and other vaccine or immunization related issues and to the prevention of untoward effects of the vaccine or immunization. There are special considerations when during surveillance, such as training of healthcare workers, because healthcare workers administer the vaccines. They're also on the front lines and usually the first responders to adverse events and also adverse events of special interest. They need to be trained on how to detect, report, and respond to adverse events and also stabilize the patient and communicate with end users, the community, and the media. Also, the need to determine causality. Um, and independent review is also needed. There's a need for independent review of adverse events separate from the immunization product, uh, program. So causality assessment requires a team of investigators, including immunologists or other experts, depending on the nature of the adverse event. 
And the team should not directly include officials from the National Immunization Program, as this may be, may be perceived as a conflict of interest, as they are responsible for investigating adverse events related to administration of a vaccine. So just to touch a little bit on vaccine regulations. So today, vaccine regulation includes a range of functions that cover the entire continuum of vaccine development, licensure, and use. And it includes regulatory bodies at national and international level. So this is kind of just a framework that shows how you have the international and also the um, national. So the national is mainly the National Regulatory Authority, National Immunization Program, and there's a review committee and other support groups. So in South Africa, SAPRA, which is the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, is the national regulatory authority that oversees the safety, efficacy, and quality of all medicines in South Africa, registered in South Africa, including vaccines. The National Department of Health expanded program of immunization, that is our national immunization program for COVID-19 vaccination programs, and they collaborate with SAPRA to oversee vaccine safety. For passive surveillance, we actually use the Med Safety app, and this is where the public and health professionals are encouraged to report any adverse events. And there's also a hotline uh, for COVID-19. The National Immunization Safety Expert Committee, um, this is a committee that conducts the causality assessment. So here's a diagram pretty much showing how it happens in South Africa from adverse events, detection to notifying and reporting, management, investigation, analysis, and causality assessment, and all the way back to feedback. And this is just a um, diagram that's showing about how the Med Safety app works to report an adverse event following um, immunization. And if you go on the NICD, for example, website, you can even look at COVID-19 surveillance um, reports. And thank you for listening. And of course, protect yourself from coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Dr. Kulonji. On the COVID-19 vaccine safety, you're encouraged to type your questions for her on the content of the presentations in the question and answer box. And I'm going to ask Dr. Kulonji to go and have a look at the Q&A box and answer some of the questions that are there. Um, um, uh, colleagues have already answered some of those questions from the panelist side. But if you look at the answered tab, you may want to add additional uh, comments to questions that are there in the answered tab, the second tab in the Q&A box. Thank you very much again. That was Dr. Kulonji on COVID-19 vaccine safety. So without further delay, um, I want to now immediately go over to our second speaker. Um, and uh, if you could just unshare your slides, Dr. Kalonji, thanks. Um, and then I will, by way of introduction, uh, share with you this particular slide. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce to you our second speaker, Dr. Yamanya Tembo. He's, she's a public health medicine registrar at the University of Cape Town. And prior to her time as a registrar, she was a district health manager in a rural district in Zambia. And a time there was ignited, has had ignited her interest in public health. During her time as a registrar, she's been involved in COVID-19 outbreak response management and COVID-19 vaccination rollout. She's passionate about health systems strengthening and is excited about the paradigm shift in healthcare that was forced on us by the pandemic. With that very short introduction, I'm going to stop sharing that slide and ask um, Dr. Tembo to just um, open a microphone and share her presentation slides with us um, and proceed on the topic of COVID-19 workplace vaccination program. Um, and while that is happening, a reminder, please just type your questions for the presenters and the content of the presentations in the question and answer box. The chat box is just for general aspects. Um, for those who've asked if this has been recorded, yes, it is. And the links will be made available after the event. Uh, probably Monday, given that it's a weekend after our session has ended, as well as for those who want the CPD link and password to register to do the CPD test. And upon the successful conclusion of that test, you'll be issued with a CPD cert attendance certificate. That will also potentially be only circulated on Monday as well, because we'll be including all the multiple choice questions on the content of our presenters' slides in their test for you. Without further delay, I hand over to uh, Dr. Tembo. Um, and I hand over to you. If you could open your microphone and proceed. 
Thank you so much, uh, Ashraf. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, as uh, Ashraf had mentioned, um, I'll be just presenting some of the experiences uh, about setting up and running a workplace vaccination program, specifically speaking of experiences from the Sisonke One um, vaccination uh, study um, at that happened at Kutuskia Hospital here in the Western Cape. Oh dear. Um, just this is going to be the brief outline of what, uh, what I will discuss. Uh, it looks like a lot, but um, I'm uh, very confident that we will be able to get through it uh, in the 25 minutes allocated. Um, so the COVID vaccination uh, program was rolled out as a major component of the National Department of Health uh, overall COVID-19 uh, response. Um, and this started on the 17th of February when the first uh, COVID vaccines were administered in, in South Africa. Now, due to uh, the initial limited uh, supply of vaccines, uh, the vaccines had to be rationed using a risk-based approach. And based on that approach, um, the rollout plan, as um, shown on the right, had three phases that overlapped. The first phase had healthcare workers. The second phase had essential workers and other people who are deemed to be at greater risk. And then the third phase had uh, people who had relatively uh, less risk. And it was decided that the first access be given to healthcare workers with these two things that they, they considered. One was um, who is a healthcare worker? So it was very important for us to define clearly who we are considering a health worker. And then secondly, we also had to uh, think about who was at greatest risk. So not only within the greater uh, population of South Africa, but also within you know, the group of health workers who's at, at, uh, who's at greatest risk because of the way the, the staggered delivery of uh, the, the vaccines would come through to each province and each site. And so the rationale uh, was that we had to protect the health system and ensure that it remains responsive and capable uh, of meeting demand for care. And, and as a result of uh, us choosing to have health, uh, health workers as our first uh, target uh, population, most of, the, um, uh, most of the vaccine centers were initially located in health facilities, but as you know now have uh, now become decentralized. So now prior to this uh, setup of um, uh, the vaccination uh, sites, the provinces had to uh, decide who, uh, you know, had to um, enumerate the number of health workers within, each, it, uh, within uh, its borders. And this was really just to ensure that there was um, adequate um, uh, distribution across the provinces. And then also they had to ensure that there was an equal, uh, equitable distribution between public and private uh, facilities alike. And uh, province then had to identify suitable sites for the for vaccination to, to occur in. And each vaccination site had to be registered for accreditation and inclusion on the master facility list that was run by the NDOH. Each site also had to choose, appoint a facility um, representative. And so during this time, there was quite a number of uncertainties. And uh, because of that, we had to rely very much on our planning, on evidence, and on uh, our agility to be able to cope with these changes. One of the changes that was um, has, gives you a stock uh, you know, example of this was just the change from AstraZeneca to the J&J &J vaccine. Um, if you remember, AstraZeneca just before the the rollout started, um, you know, was shown to be less effective against the strain that was circulating at the time, and so and at the same time, luckily there was this J and J vaccine that was showing very um, good efficacy against the the circulating COVID strain at the time, and so there was this uh, switch uh, to J and J, and this. 
um, you know, resulted in a few changes. One was obviously the delay on, in dates uh, for rollout. Then there was also the change to vaccinator training manuals, uh, changes that had to be made to the electronic vaccine data system, which is a system on which we capture all the activities of the um, vaccination happening. And then uh, it also resulted in changes in processes at the sites, as we now had to work and accommodate researchers. If you remember, this j, &J was given to us as part of a um, research uh, implementation research study. And so we had to then shift strategies to accommodate these changes. So, um, you know, part of, uh, as all of this is going on, we also had to, uh, you know, go about the actual work of categorizing our healthcare workers within our facility to, to know who would, who among our staff would receive the vaccines first and who would, you know, who can stand to wait a little bit uh, later. And so based on the advice from the expert advisory committee, both at the province and at, at um, National Department of Health, we, they, they made this risk scoring that was based on, um, individual vulnerability by age, by which age, um, greater age is more at risk, individual vulnerability by comorbidities, and there were specific comorbidities that we're looking at that, uh, you know, uh, increased your risk, uh, your adverse outcomes for, for COVID, um, such as hypertension and diabetes, um, then, you know, risk of exposure of the staff. So just categorizing each staff, what is the, the, your risk of exposure for COVID? And then the criticality of the area in which this particular healthcare worker uh, was working it. And specifically, we're looking at places like your emergency centers, your ICUs, your theaters as critical services that you know, needed to continue running in the healthcare platform. And so this risk, was, uh, this risk categorization was implemented by our line managers within their teams to categorize each of their staff. And all of this was collated into one master file. Um, so once we had categorized uh, our, st uh, staff, uh, our staff, we went about the actual practical um, work of setting up our vaccination site. And in doing this, we had a lot of um, uh, you know, assistance and doc documents that we uh, received from the provincial health office to aid us in this, um, in this task. And some of the things that we thought about were is our, is our venue suitable? Taking into account COVID restrictions for social distancing capacity and adequate airflow. You know, do we have the equipment that we need and the information technology? So things like your computers, do we have adequate network lines? Um, you know, how, how much furniture do we need? Do we need, you know, tables, chairs? Um, you know, where do we place our bins? Uh, resuscitation equipment and, and critical as well was cold storage because we had to ensure that we main, maintained the, the cold chain for our vaccines. Then we also thought about, you know, the consumables that we're actually using during the vaccination process. So such as your alcohol hand rub, your cotton buds, your, your strapping, uh, you know, and then um, we also put some thought about the towards the information material that we would actually need. So this is for staff, um, you know, all the training materials that they would need, the job aids that, that, that would help them to ref, refer to if they uh, come across any challenges. Um, and also the information that would give the people receiving the vaccines. So this included, you know, the leaflets that they would get as they uh, leave the vaccination center. It's the posters that uh, would show them the flow of, uh, of, of uh, things at the vaccination site and where to go. Uh, we also had to th think about um, handling of waste. And I mean, lucky for us, we are a health facility. And so uh, because of that, we didn't have to put in too many resources into the way we handle our waste because we already had these systems in place being a hospital. Um, and so uh, we only had to think about how we are going to ensure that we maintain uh, this, these processes from the vaccine center to the places where we, um, we dispose of our, our, our waste. And also critically ensuring that, you know, our vials um, do not end up in the community because there was, at this time, there was quite a lot of risk uh, with 
you know, perhaps ending up with uh, counterfeit goods being refilled into these empty containers and then possibly sold on the black market. Lastly, we also thought about, um, you know, the way the flow through the center would occur. And this we did just to ensure that we minimize the cross um, uh, exposure between, uh, you know, staff as they um, go, as they uh, walk through the, the facility. And so just ensuring that we had one entrance, one exit, and one direction of flow uh, through the facility. And so this is how we had uh, a mock of how we set up our facility with one entrance and one exit. And the flow through the, this um, facility was counterclockwise. And we, um, and we were lucky in that our site had actually been built spe uh, specially for um, the vaccine, um, sorry, the, the COVID, um, COVID testing. And so it had ad adequate ventilation, it had extraction. Um, the only thing that we had to add in were uh, a few network points and uh, all the computers, but it was a very adequate space for us to use. As you can see on the top right, that's just some of the cubicles, um, you know, with staff getting vaccinated. And on the lower uh, left, that's the entrance to the registration area and a pre-vaccination um, waiting area where the, 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 the chairs can be seen. So now before the health workers presented themselves to the vaccine uh, center, there were some processes that they needed to, to do. Healthcare workers had to register on their electronic um, data system. Um, and once they registered, they would receive this invitation to participate on the trial based on their eligibility and prioritization. And then they would also get an acceptance or uh, they would have to accept this invitation and complete a consent form online. And once this was completed, they would then receive a voucher and an invitation to present to a named facility. And in this case, all our staff were coming to British Care. And the health worker was then rostered on an on appointment schedule, given a date and a time for when they could come and receive their vaccine. One of the things that we noted during this process was that not everybody in our facility had access to a, a computer with internet or a smart device that had internet connection. And so we had to think about how, where we would place these, uh, how we would help these staff to get registered. And so initially we had a computer lab set up where uh, you know, staff could go and uh, get help to register. And later on, we, we decentralized this uh, computer lab to the front entrance of the vaccine center so that as they are waiting to enter the vaccine uh, center, they could get help to register on the, uh, on, the, um, on the EVDS system. So the process flow through the vaccine center, once they arrived and they had done, their, they had gotten their voucher, started first at the screening. So when they would come, they would be um, uh, checked off the appointment list uh, and they would um, be screened for their COVID symptoms. Uh, and remember at this point, I also mentioned that at this point is also where they could also get assistance to register on EVDS. Then they would go onto the registration uh, um, uh, part of the, of the process where their documentation would be verified by clerks and uh, the details uh, would be checked on the EVDS records to ensure uh, that these things tallied and everything that was captured correctly. And additionally, that, uh, and this was an additional point as well to help staff get registered if we had a long queue building up, say for, for instance. Then they would move on to the vaccination, the actual vaccination um, uh, stations, where they would get screening uh, for, uh, for me medical questions would be asked uh, to them, uh, just to determine whether they have any contraindications to receiving this vaccine. As Dr. Kalonji uh, mentioned, there are some ingredients that some people might be, uh, some people might be um, allergic to within the vaccine. So we would try and screen for these people and, um, you know, deal with the, uh, those people who are uh, presenting with risk accordingly. Um, the vaccinator would then administer the vaccine and these uh, details would be captured on the EVDS. 
the health worker would then move on to the observation uh, area where they would wait for 15 minutes. If any adverse e events happened, they would be dealt with in that area as it had an uh, adjoining resuscitation area. And if it was felt that there was any um, more serious intervention needed, they would quickly be uh, rushed off to the emergency center, which luckily for us was right outside the, the exit um, doors uh, of the vaccination center. So this is just showing the entrance uh, to our vaccination center and some of the posters uh, and the, the information that was given to health workers prior to them coming to the vaccine center. Um, this also just showing uh, some of the queues that would build up going all the way up the hill. Uh, the top right uh, picture there uh, depicting the research staff receiving the vaccines into the vaccine center and ensuring that cold chain had uh, had been maintained and then also the um, a vac a vaccinator at work. So when we looked at the staff and the training that was needed, um, we, we relied heavily on volunteers for our staffing, clinical volunteers and uh, clerical staff. And we, we also relied heavily on our managers, medical managers, to help us ensure that each of the cubicles uh, had a vaccinator on, on schedule uh, for, for the day. And they would manage those schedules. And if there were any gaps, the overall site coordinator, who happened to be myself at the time, uh, was uh, in charge of making sure that those uh, vaccinator slots or administrator slots were filled in. Um, and this was done with the help of other partners, such as the university, UCT. We had volunteers from UCT and from other uh, health facilities within the area. Then we also ensured that all our staff had training, um, and this was done by training modules that was provided by the NGOH and uh, adapted to be more comprehensive and summarized because we were cognizant that most of the vaccinators on our staff were already health staff who knew these things, but just needed a bit more focus to thinking about the COVID vaccine. Then we also had uh, visual guides to help our staff, um, which were pasted at each of the vaccination stations and at the admin stations. And then um, we also had training for our staff on how to use uh, EVDS and get them, uh, you know, their credentials registered on EVDS so that they were ready to go once the, the program started. So um, as part of our preparation, we also had to think of vaccine acceptance and hesitancy. This is because this was a new product on the market and understandably there was a lot of anxiety around this product. And so the uh, provincial health office carried out a survey prior to the commencement just to find out what the acceptance levels were. And there's a picture of um, some of the re results that uh, came out of one of the surveys that was done. Um, and it just showed that there was a good level of um, vaccine acceptance, about 59%, but also, also a, a high, quite a high level of vaccine hesitancy. But this isn't to be confused with vaccine, anti-vax sentiments. Um, this, is, this really just showed us that there were uh, key issues that uh, our staff were not very sure about or had concerns about the vaccine. And because of that, the province then decided to hold vaccine information sessions. But these were mostly online or on online platforms. And remember, not everybody had access to these online platforms. So um, a team, a multidisciplinary team was formed at Kritiskia and they had local in-person information sessions that ran out throughout the day, every day, uh, from the week prior to the uh, commencement of the vaccines um, into, I think, two to three weeks down the line. And the, uh, the sessions comprised of staff who are working at the hospital, occupational health and safety, IPC, uh, public relations officers, uh, doctors, nurses. And this was phenomenal because it was fellow staff giving advice to their fellow staff. And, be, and because of this, they, you know, they, these were people who they hold in high esteem, who they could trust, who they could, who they felt that they could go to if they, if anything, if they had any other further questions. And these people were able to break down the information into simplified language to help them to understand. And as more and more people got vaccinated with no adverse effects, more and more people were encouraged to, uh, to get vaccinated. 
Then during the process, we also had to manage the way the adverse events. And so for immediate reactions, we had set up a re resuscitation area right next to our post-vaccination waiting area, which was fully equipped and manned by two nursing staff at, at, at every moment. And there were doctors also on duty. We ensured that there was a doctor on duty all the time in the vaccination center if we needed any extra assistance. And then as I mentioned as, as well, we were also conveniently located right next to the uh, emergency center where we could quickly rush off a, a, a health worker if, if need be. And then based on what was most likely symptoms for staff, um, they were advised on what they should do in the event that, staff, uh, that symptoms happened when they go, go home. For later onset symptoms, staff also presented themselves to the occupational health staff clinic. And they were usually given about two days off. Um, they were referred to the Sisonke help desk because remember we still had to report these uh, findings to uh, the study arm. And then uh, we also referred them to GPs if we had any concerns about the seriousness of the, the symptoms. We then also had to report these adverse events, all of them, uh, through the adverse event, events for uh, following immunizations through to the province. Um, and for the majority of the stuff, there were very few side effects. Most of the side effects that were, um, uh, that were noted uh, about 81% were mild to moderate. And only 50 health workers had adverse events that could be categorized as serious or of special interest. Uh, only 12 of them had allergic reactions that could be classified as anaphylaxis um, reactions. So this is just some of the leaflets that we're, that, you know, we're uh, giving to the, to the staff. So some of the challenges that uh, we faced were you know, to do with governance because it was a very strict governance being held strictly by NDOH. It was sometimes difficult to effect quick changes on the ground because we needed that permission from province uh, through to the National Department of Health. And then also as a direct consequence of that, when you're looking at data management, we couldn't easily access the reports from EVDA. So even though we were giving all this information into the data system, we couldn't pull out reports to help us to change our strategies or ensure that we are reaching all the health workers who are uh, registered on our system. Um, when we looked at uh, infrastructure, some of the challenges were just because of you know the because of the long queues and the social distancing requirements and you know the weather at uh, at a, at a certain point um it was difficult to have all these health workers in one place so it was quite um, a challenge uh, in trying to ensure that we are adequately social distanced without within the the facility especially when there was bad weather um, then, I mean, we, we spoke about risk communication in, in vaccine hesitancy um, and just the difficulties in trying to address each and every one of uh, the healthcare workers' concerns, uh, particularly um, that as we were, uh, you know, we were trying to counteract some of the misconceptions. There were new misconceptions coming out almost hourly, it's, it felt like. So it was quite a challenge in that. Um, then I think specifically when we're looking at risk categorization, when we looked at who is a healthcare worker, it was sometimes difficult to completely define who is a healthcare worker because at some time the, the criteria was widened to include any staff that um, in directly or indirectly assisted in improving the health of, of the health outcomes. And so, um, you know, was it, do you include people like people who um, supply prosthetics to a hospital? Um, so there was a, a few gray areas that we had to handle and kind of delineate for ourselves within the, the, the facility. Then also challenges in just, uh, you know, categorizing the kind of exposure that uh, someone ha has was uh, quite difficult. Um, then when you look at the logistics and planning, um, there were several delays that really just were part of the research component because of the stringencies that were, um, you know, uh, had to be uh, maintained because of because it was a research um, component. And then the fact that we relied heavily on staffing also really, uh, you know, um, 
caused the challenge because then we constantly had to ensure that we had uh, adequate stuff every morning um, and fill in those gaps whenever we didn't. Then when looking at the successes, I think I cannot underscore the, you know, the immense um, success that having this multidisciplinary team managing the site uh, played into the overall success of the, of the, um, of the program. Um, we also uh, were able to, we had daily meetings with the provincial health office. And I think our feedback really laid the groundwork for some of the governance arrangements to change and allow flexibility such that when the program rolled out to the greater community, it was much more uh, flexible and easily easy to implement. Um, then when we looked at the data management, uh, we had, if you recall, we had issues with getting data back from EVDS. So we had to keep parallel records of the activities on the ground to help us kind of understand what was going on. And, and then also us enabling the access for those without smartphones or internet connectivity, I think was a, a great um, success um, story. Um, then I think with the infrastructure, we really lucked out by having this newly built facility um, that, that was able to accommodate uh, the needs of a COVID vaccine center, uh, given the restrictions. Um, then look when we look at the risk communication, again, uh, we're looking at those information sessions that were really well received and, and well run every day, three times a day. And again, just the wealth of the multidisciplinary team that came together to actually give these sessions and run these sessions. Uh, and then lastly, I think um, one of the, the biggest uh, successes was also just this keeping our communication lines open, both internally and externally, um, you know, which facilitated swift changes and contributed to our low vaccine wastage uh, of less than 1%. And I cannot underscore the impact of this program. I'm sure a lot of you had seen um, this uh, graphic that was circulating, just showing uh, what we were initially seeing uh, in, uh, in early September following the, 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 the vaccine program of how many people were hospitalized and in high care and on ventilator ventilators at critical care hospital. The study that followed the Sisonke uh, implementation study also showed that, um, you know, the, of the individuals who were vaccinated, we were able to um, prevent 83% of COVID-related deaths and prevent 75% of uh, COVID-related uh, hospital admissions requiring critical or intensive care, and 67% uh, of COVID-related hospitalizations. Thank you so very much uh, for your attention. Um, this is just some of the references that I use that you can look at um, in your own time to get a bit more understanding of everything that uh, went on. And many thanks to the team that uh, assisted me. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Yamanya Tembo on the topic COVID-19 workplace vaccination program and giving you significant insight into what has happened there in her experience. So without further delay, I'm going to immediately introduce our next speaker. And um, oops, I think that's the wrong screen. There we go. And uh, I'm going to introduce Professor Sabi Shabir Madi, who's um, who will be introducing COVID-19 vaccine update for us. Um, Prof is uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences and Professor of Vaccinology at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. He also holds the position of Director of the South African Medical Research Council Vaccines and Infectious Diseases Analytics Research Unit, the VIDA and is co-director of the African Leadership Initiative for Vaccinology Expertise, that's alive. He is an internationally recognized, he is internationally recognized for his research on vaccines against life-threatening diseases in childhood, in pregnant women and against respiratory diseases, which informed the World Health Organization recommendations on the use of these vaccines in low and middle income settings. Most recently, he led the first two COVID-19 vaccine studies being undertaken in Africa and has been involved in multiple epidemiological studies in COVID-19 in South Africa. He has been widely con compl complimented uh, for his stance on COVID-19 in South Africa, where he is considered a trusted uh, and unafraid 
a voice, a trusted voice, unafraid to speak truth to power. So with those words, I welcome Professor Shabir Madi, and uh, I see that he's already sharing his slides. I'm going to ask him to open his microphone and then to proceed with his presentation. Thank you very much, Professor. And while the, here we go. please go ahead, thanks. I think, and thanks for this invite. So what I'm going, to, what I've been requested to do was to give an update on COVID-19 vaccines. And I guess uh, what's of particular importance in a current context in South Africa is uh, the effectiveness in effectiveness of vaccines against Omicron, but also how to move forward uh, in the midst of what has really been a vaccine roller program that has struggled. And so it has met uh, has missed almost all of the targets which it initially set out to achieve. Uh, but before doing that, I think it's important for us just to reflect as to what the COVID trajectory has been in South Africa, uh, because that will, to some extent, uh, determine what we can expect moving forward and should also influence the manner in which we think about continuing rolling out vaccines and particularly where to actually focus rather than being extremely diffuse and probably achieving very little consequently. Now, one of the major challenges that we have faced on the African continent, and South Africa is no exception, despite it being probably among, despite it being a country, but among the highest testing rate across the entire continent, is that compared to many other countries, we have uh, pretty much lagged behind when it comes to the number of tests that have been done per capita. So I'm just using two examples here, that's the United States and the United Kingdom. And what we find is that during the course when Omicron wave was circulating in South Africa, uh, when we were reporting 29,000 cases and the United Kingdom were perhaps reporting 40, 50,000 cases, uh, the reality is that it's impossible to make any head-to-head -head comparisons between those numbers, uh, other than the fact that the United Kingdom has got a larger population by about 20 million, what's even more impressive is that they were doing 20 times more testing that, than was being done in South Africa. And similarly in uh, the United States, that has got a population size which is six times greater than South Africa, when they were documenting a million cases of COVID uh, at a peak of the Omicron wave, and South Africa was reporting a maximum of 30,000 cases at a peak of the Omicron wave. Uh, those reports were coming from a country, as I mentioned, that was six times larger than South Africa, and that was doing six times more testing than South Africa. So given the limited amount of testing that's been done, and like I said, South Africa has performed much better than most other African countries, been one of the reasons why more than 40% of all of the COVID-19 cases documented on the African continent has taken place in South Africa. Uh, what we can't do is make any sort of head, meaningful head-to-head -head comparisons with other settings uh, where testing rates are very different. Mm -hmm. Now, what is this actually materialized in? So currently, I think the estimate, and I've stopped looking at the numbers because the numbers are pretty meaningless. Uh, I think there's about three and a half million uh, people that have been documented with COVID-19 in South Africa. Uh, but the reality is that after the Omicron wave, we're probably now sitting with 80 to 85 percent of the population having been infected with the virus at least once which obviously makes a mockery of continuing reporting on three and a half million recorded cases, because what we've now come to understand through a series of serial surveys that have been conducted is that the force of infection that has transpired in South Africa has been huge. Uh, despite all of the restrictions that government uh, tried to impose, uh, all of the regulations, some of which are completely obsolete, but are ongoing even in this day and age, Despite all of those regulations, uh, before the onset of the Omicron wave, and this was a population-based survey in Gauteng, what we identified was that 73%, seven out of every 10 people in Gauteng had been infected with the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus at least once since the start of the COVID pandemic. After the Omicron wave, which was due to a variant that is much more infectious than anything that we had seen earlier, uh, and was causing a large number of breakthrough infections as well as reinfections in people that were vaccinated or people with past infection respectively. After the onset of the Omicron wave, we can now expect 80% to 85% of people to have been infected with a virus at least once in South Africa. And these are data which are not thumb sucking. Uh, this is a repeat of a zero survey that is currently underway in Gauteng, a uh, population-based zero survey, where the current average is 85% after the Omicron wave. Now, even before the Omicron wave, in some places in Gauteng, as an example, in the city of Johannesburg, the percentage of people that were testing positive 
uh, for antibody as symmetric for pass infection was 85%. Now, Gauteng makes up 25% of the South African population, so roughly about 15 million people. And in Gauteng alone right now, the number of people that have been infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, 80% of 15 million, you can do the mathematics, and clearly nowhere close to three and a half million. So three and a half million at the national level is a massive underestimate. And the number of people that have been infected with a virus up until now in South Africa is in a region of 45 to 50 million, uh, rather than um, three and a half million. So this is important because what we've now come to understand about natural infection, and it is not unique for SARS-CoV-2, this is the way most respiratory viruses evolve over time and why they become more of a nuisance factor eventually, but it still cause death, but become more of a nuisance factor is because we have evolution of natural infection induced immunity. Now, that is not to say that we're encouraging people to go out to be infected, and I'll show you why. Now, in addition to that population-based zero survey, to corroborate uh, those findings was another study that was done by Cheryl Cohen from the NICD, where they did a household transmission study in a rural setting and an urban setting. And what they documented, again, before the onset of the Omicron wave, was something which was very similar to what we had shown in a cross-sectional population-based zero survey. And that is in urban settings, 75% of people have been infected at least once in these households since the start of the pandemic. And in a rural setting, it was sitting at about 60%. But what you also see quite strikingly here is that a positivity rate from serology is almost identical to the positivity rate for serology and PCR or PCR, which means that very little additional cases will be documented by PCR compared to what were documented by serology. But more important than that is 85%, now this was where serial samples were being collected in the household. 85% of infections that transpired were completely asymptomatic. Now, why is this important? This is important because if you are wanting to, for things such as contact tracing, isolation and quarantine to work, you need to be able to identify close on to 90% of the infections that are taking place to start off with. And 85% of those infections are asymptomatic and your, your testing rate is nominal for all intents and purposes. You effectively not identifying more than 10% of all of the infections that have transpired. And that makes it completely uh, meaningless uh, to continue with contact tracing because you're not identifying the majority of contacts with people that are infected. Uh, it makes it meaningless to ask people to go into quarantine uh, because the majority of people that are exposed to someone that are infected don't know they've been inf infected. And in fact, when it comes to people going into isolation, you can also debate the, the merits of doing that. Uh, because as I mentioned, only one out of every 10 people that are infected are actually going into isolation. So you don't expect uh, the trajectory of the pandemic to be very different than whether than if those 10% 10 10 of people continued uh, mingling in society. And that is the reality. Now that such a large percentage of people were asymptomatic shouldn't come as a surprise because six months into the pandemic, there were already reports uh, that 50 to 60% of infections in countries where there were a lot of testing was taking place, a lot of uh, contact tracing was taking place, 50 to 60% of infections were asymptomatic. In children, that was as high as 80%. Now, what is all these large numbers of infections materializing? It has materialized in evolution of natural infection-induced immunity. And natural infection-induced immunity works pretty well, not only against protecting against severe disease, but as I'll show you, probably works slightly better than even messenger RNA vaccines in protecting against infection due to a new variant. But this massive infection that has taken place came at a huge cost of life. So the number of people that have died of COVID-19 in South Africa is not 99,800 and whatever other units you want to put to it. The number of people that have died in South Africa today is close to 300,000. And these are based on the South African Medical Research Council excess mortality estimates. Now, why do we believe that the majority of these excess mortality are COVID deaths and not something else, uh, some other disease that has been neglected during the course of COVID? And the reason for that is that if you look at the trajectory of the COVID reported death and the trajectory of this excess mortality, they're almost completely in sync, strongly indicating that the main way to attribute, the only disease to really attribute this excess mortality 
two is COVID-19. And this is exactly the same sort of modeling that is usually traditionally used in other settings, including in South Africa, to sort of try to understand, as an example, the number of people that die of influenza illness. So the number of people that have died of COVID-19 in South Africa is close to 300,000. Now, 300,000 itself is a meaningless number uh, because 300,000 in South Africa might mean very something very different compared to 1 million people having died in the, in the United States, which is what they're reaching. Does that mean the United States has done worse in South Africa? And the answer is no. And the reason for that, like I mentioned, the United States population is six times greater. They've done more testing. And in fact, the majority of people that have died is actually uh, accounted for or recorded. And the recorded deaths and excess mortality are almost identical in the United States, or maybe a 15, 20% difference. Now, the better way to interpret the data is to look at the number of deaths per 100,000. And in South Africa, we're sitting at 500 per 100,000. That places South Africa firmly among the top 10 countries with the highest COVID mortality rate globally. If the Northern Cape was a country of its own, sitting at close to 700 per 100,000 deaths due to COVID-19, the Northern Cape would be amongst the top three countries with the highest COVID-19 mortality rate globally. So for all, effects and pur for, all, uh, for all purposes, South Africa has performed dismally in protecting against infections and hasn't done well in protecting lives being lost due to COVID-19. Now, part of the reason for that, unfortunately, is a consequence of what has been a disastrous rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. And we should stop pretending that we've made significant progress because, like I said, we haven't. And the reason for this, unfortunately, goes back to January of 2021. On the 2nd of January, a group of scientists wrote this article in a Daily Maverick, which clearly pointed out that whilst many other high-income countries, as well as many African countries, were beginning to deploy COVID-19 vaccines into the immunization program, and these were vaccines that started to be deployed after those really fascinating data came through in November of 2020, uh, South Africa yet didn't seem to have a plan. And in fact, if anything, there were people, senior officials, that were downplaying the prospects for the availability and usefulness of COVID-19 vaccines in South Africa. The government was called upon to basically indicate what exactly its plan was. And Zapiro pretty much summed up what the government's rollout plan was in the beginning of January 2021. And that it was completely absent. Overnight, a plan was sort of uh, cooked up. Uh, government indicated uh, a few days later that they were going to vaccinate 40 million people by the end of 2021, 40 million people by the end of 2021. Uh, and then they came up with this roadmap, which I think the previous speaker showed about which groups were going to be prioritized and which groups were going to be completed by when I think people above the age of 60 were meant to have been completed by about uh, May of 2021 already. And there were all of these ambitions, aspirational goals, which clearly were going to fail for a number of reasons, including the reality that there was very little preparation in addition to no vaccine having been procured at that point in time. Uh, there was simply very little preparation for the deployment of these vaccines. And then there was this notion that South Africa is somehow unique and was going to implement some electronic vaccine data system, which was going to shepherd people to go to a specific place to be vaccinated at a specific time on a specific date. Now, that is somewhat oblivious to the realities that most South Africans live under. And that is the vast majority of them don't have access to be able to, to actually register on an EVDS site, let alone plan to be at a place where they expect it to be on a given time and a given day without being provided resources to do so. So what materialized? What materialized is that eventually government was able to get one, one and a half million doses of vaccine from Serum Institute of India. It arrived on the 1st of February, 2021 amongst, amongst a lot of fanfare. Unfortunately, uh, we were at the same time doing a study of the AstraZeneca vaccine, and we actually ended up uh, releasing our results the very same night uh, that these, uh, that these uh, vaccines arrived in South Africa. And disappointingly, what we showed is that AstraZeneca vaccine didn't protect against the beta variant, which was then dominating COVID, the COVID wave in South Africa. What we showed, what we showed effectively is that 
He wants to borrow 10%. So basically no efficacy against the beta variant. But this was against mild to moderate COVID-19. The study wasn't designed to look at severe disease. We didn't have the right population group to look at severe disease, but we showed that the vaccine doesn't protect against mild to moderate COVID-19. Now, that didn't come as a surprise because before we did an unblinding of the study, we also had data from the NICD, from Penny Moore's lab, from Alex Siegel lab, which convincingly showed that the beta variant, variant was relatively antibody evasive to the neutralizing activity that was induced by the vaccines. So it didn't come as too much of a surprise that in the absence of neutralizing activity that is induced by the AstraZeneca vaccine against the beta variant, the vaccine is not going to protect against mild to moderate COVID-19. But at the same time, what we showed in the same study was that although the antibody didn't show neutralizing activity against the beta variant, uh, and that is antibody induced by the vaccine, uh, the vaccine-induced T-cell immunity, the CD4 and the CD8 responses were largely preserved. Uh, 76 of the 87 T-cell responses that's induced by the AstraZeneca vaccine were largely preserved, including most of the natural killer cell responses. So at that stage, we were already seeing a disconnect of how vaccines protect against infection as opposed to severe disease. And consistently, all of the studies were showing greater protection against severe disease compared to how well vaccines were protecting against infection and mild disease. Now, based on these data, coupled with animal um, uh, experiments that were being done at the same time, where mice were basically given an AstraZeneca vaccine and then challenged either with the alpha variant or the beta variant. And what they showed in these animal model studies, or oh, they were challenged for the control, which basically means uh, they were not vaccinated, but challenged for the, uh, sorry, they were controls, not vaccinated, but challenged for the same variants. And what they showed is that the mice that were vaccinated, when they were challenged for the alpha and the beta variant, their lungs remained completely healthy, macroscopically and microscopically. Mice that didn't receive the AstraZeneca vaccine, their lungs were pretty much destroyed after being challenged for the alpha as well as for the beta variant. So these were data that were now accumulating, indicating that although the AstraZeneca vaccine wouldn't protect against infection and mild COVID, it could still protect against severe disease. Now, based on this, WHO made a recommendation that there was indirect evidence which is compatible with the protection against severe COVID-19 for the AstraZeneca vaccine. And even those countries where the beta variant was circulating, they should still continue using the AstraZeneca vaccine in those countries. Why? Because not we were trying to prevent infections, but because vaccines are really designed and have always been designed mainly to prevent severe disease and protect people from dying. When vaccines protect against infection, that's a welcome bonus. And that allows us to bring about a reduction in transmission of the virus much more effectively. But that's not what vaccines are developed for. So WHO made this recommendation, and this recommendation was subsequently supported uh, by a study from Canada, which basically showed that even a single dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, or two doses, provided 80 to 90% protection against hospitalization and death due to the beta or the gamma variant. Against the Delta variant, the AstraZeneca vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine, a single dose here, against the Delta variant, Basically, AstraZeneca, as well as a messenger RNA vaccine, you've got close on to 90% protection against hospitalization and death. So, at South Africa, used the AstraZeneca vaccine rather than selling it off to other African countries where the beta variant was also circulating, uh, with that one and a half million doses of vaccine. As I'll show you, we probably would have saved 20,000 lives, 20,000 people from dying above the age of 50, had they received only a single dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which conferred 80% protection against hospitalization or death due to the beta variant. But as it happened, the beta variant wasn't a problem by the time we started to roll out our vaccines, not in February. February was really for healthcare workers, and that wasn't a rollout of vaccines. The vaccine bailout really only started around about June, uh, very much at a time when the Delta variant has arisen and pretty much had replaced the beta variant. And as I showed you, as it happened, the AstraZeneca vaccine and every other vaccine works extremely well in protecting against the Delta variant. So not only did we go against WHO recommendation for the beta variant, but we had we not been stubborn and listened to WHO, we actually would have introduced a vaccine and we would actually have had protection against the Delta variant. And we might just well have had more vaccines coming in from India rather than only the one and a half million, which would have accelerated 
the start of the vaccine program. Where did we stay, sit when it came to the, the, the Omicron variants? So as you've seen here, in, as all of us know, on the 25th of November, there was an announcement that Omicron wave is uh, uh, a new variant that evolved. And very soon we saw the Omicron variant very much displace uh, the Delta variant in South Africa. Now, in Gauteng, at the start of the, the Omicron wave, on the 25th of November, only one third of the population had received at least a single dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. In people above the age of 50, rather than 90% of them having been vaccinated, it's set to 60%. In a 12 to 18 year age group, 11%, 18 to 50 year age group, about one third of those. So clearly we were nowhere on track almost by the end of 2021 to get anywhere close to 70% of the vaccine of the population being vaccinated, which was what the, the government had indicated the target was in January of 2021. Now, despite that, as I mentioned, we have already shown now, before the onset of the Omicron wave in Gauteng, that even unvaccinated individuals, including children as young as 12 to 18, 73% of them were seropositive, meaning that they were previously infected with the virus. Adults above the age of uh, 18, 70% of those that were un unvaccinated were seropositive. The vaccinated individuals, 93% of them were seropositive, which is not a surprise because vaccines are going to uh, obviously a result in an antibody response. And this antibody response, although the antibody might not uh, be uh, a metric as to whether people are protected against infection, is a reasonable proxy as to the extent of underlying T cell immunity that exists, which will protect against severe disease and death. What was the consequence of all of this? And I'm just going to take you briefly through this here. Uh, so that's basically so then for Gauteng and for most of the other provinces, it would plot almost a, in a very similar manner. And what it shows you in the dotted orange is the number of infections that are reported, in blue, the number of hospitalizations that are documented with the virus, including incidental infections. In black is the number of people that have died of COVID-19. And particularly here, I'm showing the excess mortality estimates in solid orange is the number of people that have been recorded to have died of COVID-19. The percentage indicates what percentage of those events occurred in a particular wave since the start of the pandemic, and the number in parentheses indicates the incidence per 100,000. And what we see happening, despite a modest uptake of vaccine in Gauteng, is a massive decoupling of infections and severe disease and death. So the Omicron wave contributed to only 10% of all of the infections that occurred in Gauteng since the start of the pandemic, or 10% of all hospitalizations, 20% of all infections since the start of the pandemic. And only 3% of all of the people that died of COVID-19 in Gauteng since the start of the pandemic occurred during the course of the Omicron wave. In contrast, before we started to roll out COVID-19 vaccines and the missed opportunity of introducing vaccine at the end of the beta variant wave, the Delta variant wave was responsible for 44% of all of the hospitalizations that had transpired since the start of the pandemic, and half of the people that died in Gauteng were deaths that occurred during the course of the Delta variant wave. 50% of all of the deaths that occurred since the start of the pandemic occurred during a single wave when there was almost absolutely no protection except for healthcare workers through vaccination. Because South Africa didn't roll out the vaccine, went against WHO policy, didn't procure vaccine early enough, didn't have a plan in place. And this is the human cost of having really messed up with the vaccine rollout program. So these data are very similar in a 50 to 59 year age group. Only 2% of all of the deaths that has occurred in this age group, including people above the age of 60, occurred during the course of the Omicron wave. And the reason why this age group is especially important is because 80% of all of the COVID-19 deaths uh, before the onset of the Omicron wave it occurred in people above the age of 50 in South Africa. So we've seen a massive decoupling of infections. 53% of all of the deaths in this age group occurred again during the course of the Delta variant wave. Children 5 to 19, where there was a modest uptake of vaccine, again, we see a very similar sort of a picture. Their mortality rate was always very low in the region of 1 per 100,000. 17% of all of the deaths in children 5 to 19 years, where there was very little vaccine uptake, occurred during the course of the Omicron wave compared with 47% having occurred during the course of the Delta variant wave. But important in children is that this incidence for death, one per 100,000, is substantially lower 
then the incidence is observed in people above 50 to 59 as an example, where even during the course of the Omicron wave, it's still it's sitting at nine per 100,000 rather than one per 100,000, which has always been the case in children under the age of 18. Now, what do we know about vaccines and Omicron? Uh, so these were data published from South Africa at an early stage after Omicron uh, arose, uh, published by, from a discovery uh, database, which not unsurprisingly didn't show uh, that uh, didn't, it showed that uh, the vaccines were less effective, were less effective against Omicron than the Delta variant strain. The protection against effectiveness of two doses of the Pfizer vaccine was sitting at 33% compared with 80% due to the Delta variant strain. And the longer ago that people received their uh, second dose of vaccine, the lower the effectiveness, because in addition to Omicron being antibody evasive, there was also waning of antibodies. So people that had received their second dose three to four months before the onset of Omicron, vaccine effectiveness there only was around about 25%. Now, that didn't come as a surprise, as I mentioned, because what we had seen uh, from the laboratory, even before the data became available, is that this is looking at neutralizing antibody activity in people that receive two doses of Pfizer or two doses of uh, AstraZeneca, four to six months later, one month later, two doses of that was two doses of Moderna and then two doses of Pfizer. But all of the studies, what they show is that after two doses of vaccine, when you look at the amount, percentage of the number of people that have antibody activity against Omicron is almost zero. One out of 10, zero out of 10, uh, and for, five, for Pfizer up to two doses, slightly better, but that was because it's one month after the second dose. So the tell us that Omicron is antibody evasive, and we don't expect one or two doses of vaccine to do too much, and less so, if the vaccines were given some time ago. But in addition to that, people with past infection due to the alpha variant, beta variant, delta variant, they too showed very little antibody activity against Omicron. But where it did differ is people that might have had a heterologous uh, approach where they've had a combination of AstraZeneca followed by Pfizer, or this could be Johnson & Johnson followed by Pfizer, where, they into, where that heterologous approach induces a much more robust antibody response that is actually able to overcome some of the antibody evasiveness of Omicron. 14 out of 20 still had activity if they had this heterologous vaccine approach, which was something that we were advocating for for healthcare workers a long, long time ago, more than six months ago. Now, although Omicron is antibody evasive, what we also see is that Omicron is still unable to fully evade T cell immunity. And in fact, the majority of T cell responses still are relatively preserved including 75 to 83% of the different CD8 responses. When we talk of T-cell responses, there's multiple different epitopes that are actually targeted to the T-cell responses, much more diverse than epitopes that, epitopes that are then using utilizing antibody responses. And the vast majority of the T-cell responses remain relatively intact. And that's the reason why, although the vaccines might not protect against infection in mild COVID, we find that with a discovery database, Two doses of Pfizer vaccines still at 70% protection against hospitalization due to Omicron, although that was lower compared with effectiveness against the Delta variant. Now, these data from discovery were very much replicated in another study from, uh, from Qatar that was just published. It's actually online. It's not yet been published. And quickly, what they've shown is that people that receive two doses of the Pfizer vaccine or two doses of the Moderna vaccine, if the second dose was given a one to three months uh, before the onset of Omicron, 45% protection. If the second dose was given more than seven months ago, no protection against Omicron. Uh, the same thing for uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine, the same thing for the Moderna vaccine. So antibody, in addition to be, uh, in, the, in addition to Omicron being antibody evasive, there's also the waning of the antibody and effectively you don't have much protection six months after having been vaccinated against infection. But once you give a booster dose of vaccine, that effectiveness against infection and in mild COVID now goes back up to in a region of between 40 and 50%, both for both of the messenger RNA vaccines. But what you see, a severe disease, a very different picture, where, yes, as was shown in South Africa for a Pfizer vaccine protection after two doses, even seven months after the second dose, is 78%. By giving a booster dose, you can take that up to 90%. What, Moderna, in fact, there isn't too much to be gained. Uh, perhaps some, uh, there's overlap of the confidence intervals, but with a third dose of vaccine, you probably are getting additional protection against severe disease. 
Now, it is not to say that we need to do the same in South Africa, because unlike South Africa, Qatar hasn't had a high force of past infection. And that high force of past infection is important because a hybrid immunity probably is the most potent type of immunity that you can develop, not only against protection for severe disease, but also when it comes to protecting against infection and mild COVID. And the vast majority of people in South Africa that have been vaccinated, in fact, have got hybrid immunity because like I mentioned, 80% of people have now been infected with the virus at least once. So my last slide is just how good is past infection in protecting against infection symptomatic illness due to Omicron uh, compared to with messenger RNA vaccines. And this is data again from Qatar, and this is against Omicron. And what they basically show is that in fact, past infection, this is Omicron as well as, sorry, uh, as well as other uh, variants. And what they show that past infection in fact works better than two doses of the messenger RNA vaccines in protecting against symptomatic illness, not against severe disease. Against severe disease, they probably work the same. But past infection works as well, if not better, in protecting against symptomatic illness in people that have received two doses of the messenger RNA vaccines. Roughly about 50% more protection from past infection. And this is data that has just come out literally in this week. So it's again, it's in preprint, it's not been peer reviewed, but it's got important implications because we cannot pretend that past infection is not important. And these are the data we need to use to inform how we go about continuing with our vaccine rollout, rather than just aspiring to some magic number, which is meaningless. Past infection as shown here, irrespective of whether the vaccine, uh, people were vaccinated first and then developed infection or had infection and then vaccinated, as you can see, when it comes to antibody persistence in terms of neutralizing activity against Omicron, almost all people with hybrid immunity actually also are still have protection from symptomatic infection due to Omicron. So hybrid immunity is a major potent driver in protecting people from being infected. So past infection doesn't protect you completely against infection due to Omicron, but certainly people that have hybrid immunity might well be protected against infection and probably be less likely to transmit the virus. And that is where the entire discussion on mandatory vaccination has now fallen into inadvertently in South Africa because we didn't plan for 80% of the population to be infected. It's come at a massive cost of life, but we are where we are. And this hybrid immunity results, as, results in us being a very different situation when it comes to how what we can expect moving forward. So in conclusion, the COVID-19 regulations in South Africa unfortunately failed in preventing spread of the virus. We, uh, had they worked, we wouldn't have had, and this includes everything, including wearing a face mask. 99% uh, of South Africans don't wear the right type of face mask, don't wear it correctly, don't expect it to prevent infections, don't expect it uh, that you're going to prevent transmission into the environment. It's not going to happen. If face masks were working in South Africa, we wouldn't have had. 80%, 90% of the population been infected with the virus at least once. And the same thing goes for physical distancing. The one measure that does work is ventilation and ventilation and ventilation. And that's the reason why the risk of infect, being infected with the virus, 80% of infections occur because of indoor gatherings, either directly or indirectly, and especially indoor gatherings in poorly ventilated spaces. So with that, I mean, the fact that government and Department of Health are still wanting to keep regulations in a national in a notified med medical condition to try to prevent infections in South Africa clearly demonstrates a lack of understanding as to what has transpired and what utility those regulations have served up until now, because it hasn't protected against infections. As I mentioned, we need to get as many people vaccinated as possible. But at the same time, if you're wanting to benefit from vaccines, before the next resurgence is upon us, it's not about vaccinating 10 million or 20 million people. If we get more than 90% of people above the age of 50 vaccinated, that target alone will result in much fewer deaths occurring in South Africa than reaching some arbitrary target of 30 million doses or 40 million people being vaccinated. The focus needs to be right now, and it always should have been, on ensuring that we get more than 90% of people above the age of 50 vaccinated, rather than just changing to younger age groups simply because we weren't getting enough, getting enough uptake. 
indicated in 50-year age group. And that speaks to the issue of logistics, planning, deployment, advocacy, communication. Last but not least, yes, we are going to experience another resurgence. There will be more likely other variants, but the reality is that those variants are not going to perform any differently from earlier variants when it comes to how well vaccines protect, as well as how well past infection protects against severe disease. Because if a new variant is able to evade the T-cell immunity, then we're not dealing with COVID-19 any longer. In that case, in that case, we'll be dealing with COVID-2022 or COVID-2023, because that will be a very different type of virus and will take us back to March of 2020. So thanks for your attention and opportunity. Thank you. That was Professor Shabir Mahdi, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor of Vaccinology at the University of Witwatersrand on the topic COVID-19 um, uh, vaccine update. Uh, Prof, can you just come back on, because I think there's a few quick questions that I think we must direct to you immediately. Um, it relates to, I think, the fifth wave. Um, it relates to, if I can just quickly add a quick screenshot also of some of those um, questions there. Uh, so the one question by Savrani Mudli um, is, hi, can the NIH, well, can you, Prof, share more information on the predictions of the fifth wave of COVID-19? With winter fast approaching, we want to help our workforce and their families to prepare as not everyone is in, uh, in each family is vaccinated or perhaps might have been positive before. Uh, thus, if a person becomes COVID-19 positive, he or she can spread the virus to other family members. What is your advice on that, Prof? Yeah, like I said, uh, a resurgence is very likely to occur, uh, probably in about two months or so. Uh, and at the same time, it might well be another variant, uh, not uh, Omicron, it might be going back to Delta, or it might be something else. But again, it's no longer about preventing infections. And I think it's a mindset shift that we need to undergo. We don't have the tools available to us with vaccines to prevent infections. We don't have the tools available to us to prevent infections, period, in the South African context. non pharmacological interventions, like I said, had they worked, wouldn't have resulted in 75, 80% of people being infected to the virus at least once, had they worked. And we need to accept that to be able to move on. The focus is no longer about preventing infections. If we continue harping on that, we'll continue doing more harm than any good. Harm to the economy, harm to the livelihoods of people, harm to children that are being deprived of schools. We can't afford that to continue. So it has to be about protection against severe disease. And like I said at the end, it's all about ensuring that we got maximal protection in those individuals that are most likely to end up in hospital or die of COVID-19. In South Africa, that is anyone that has got an underlying medical condition or especially using it as a proxy, people above the age of 50. But under the age of 50, someone with uh, hypertension, obesity, they included in that category. And the focus has to be about getting more than 90% of those people vaccinated rather than pretending that we've got the vaccines at place that is gonna be able to assist us in preventing infections because the next variant might be even more antibody evasive than Omicron, which again means that vaccines are gonna play very little role in protecting against infection, but those vaccines still play an important role in protecting against severe disease. Given how we're struggling with our vaccine program and one of the challenges and reasons we struggle is we're so diffuse in our attention that we can't focus. And we have to focus to get more than 90% of people above the age of 50 vaccinated. So I'm not concerned that children have not been vaccinated. Yes, I showed you the chances of children dying of COVID-19 is nominal. Uh, and the reality is that right now, uh, children have developed immunity against severe disease, unfortunately by virtue of having been infected with the virus in large, large numbers already. Thank you, Prof. Can I just follow up and also ask our other two guests to step in um, after your initial response on this. Uh, with regard to workplace specific, um, I think I just, I'm just gonna get it out there again, there we go. Um, so there was a specific question related to the workplace and I just slipped it off the screen, there we go. Um, a question for Professor Madi. Um, there are workplaces enforcing mandatory vaccination given the high immunity in South Africa and the inability of the vaccine to completely stop transmission. What is the rationale to have mandatory vaccination in workplaces? Surely it is more important to vaccinate high risk groups, which I think you've just indicated again, how does the vaccine actually make the workplace safer? Over to you. Yeah, I think that's a really important question and we need to reflect on it because uh, at a time when this mandatory vaccination policies were developed, it was under the notion 
uh, that the COVID vaccines that we had reduced transmission uh, as well as protected against infection. And that means that you bring about indirect protection of others because you're unlikely to transmit it onward to others. Uh, so that is when this uh, mandated vaccination was conceptualized. Things have moved on since then. We know that vaccines don't work too well against infection. Vaccines, despite not protecting against infection, might still play a role in terms of reducing transmission because the T cell immunity is probably bringing about quicker viral control and consequently that person that is infected is less likely to transmit than someone that is that is uh, hasn't been previously developed immunity, T cell immunity. But the point is with 80% of the population now having been infected and also having developed this T cell immunity is an additional reason to continue with mandatory vaccination. Because like I said, natural infection induces a much more potent T cell immunity than uh, vaccines do. And the answer to that is, I showed it in the last slide, and I might have been too fast on it, is that this hybrid immunity results in a magnitude of antibody response, which is very, very different, much higher than vaccine-only induced immunity or natural infection-only induced immunity. And consequently, people with hybrid immunity are more protected against being infected with the virus. And if you're more protected against being infected with the virus, you're less likely to transmit the virus. So there's still a case to be made, I believe, especially where people are gathering in large numbers on a frequent basis indoors for, man for mandated vaccination policy if we are wanting to continue reducing infections. And preventing, I'm not saying that we should allow infections to go rabid. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, but we can't focus in preventing infections at the expense of not meeting our targets of protecting against severe disease. That is what I'm saying. But where opportunity exists to prevent infections we still need to try to make use of whatever tools we have, despite them not being the perfect tools to try to bring down the, that infection rate. Thank you, Prof. So uh, to Dr. Kolonji and um, uh, uh, Dr. Temple, there's been questions uh, in this chat as uh, in our Q&A as well, as well as our, our session yesterday that dealt with ergonomics um, around the question of workplace screening, screening of workers. Um, have you got any specific um, response and advice with regard to um, how that might um, be important to consider your own inputs and uh, Prof's inputs, as well as the shifts in, in terms of the announcements, the official announcements and the expected changes um, in regulation and guidelines? Uh, maybe I could, just, um, whoever opens the microphone first uh, between Dr. Kalanji and Dr. Temple, um, if you could just give some comment on the issue of workplace screening and your experience. Maybe I should start with, uh, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Tembo. Um, yeah, so um, I think, you know, given given the, um, some of uh, Prof uh, Shabir Madi's, um, you know, inputs, it's, uh, it's really, I think uh, workplace screening um, is becoming more and more futile. Um, and we should, again, like our focus should be in trying to prevent the, um, you know, the, the severe illnesses and the deaths and the overwhelming of the health system. And, um, you know, and, and I think this is kind of where the, the government is going towards in some of its um, advice and, uh, you know, and the new regulations that are coming uh, forward um, following, you know, that we are anticipating following the the end of the disaster management regulations um so yeah i think that's it's it's it won't be it's it's not useful and and it's just very time consuming and for the most part i think um you know the use of those um workplace screening um or you know uh, forms has been variable uh, and uh, and not as useful usually the contact tracers, whoever it is, would would start afresh and you know um, start taking new um, uh, uh, contact uh, uh, details from uh, you know help, you know staff who are sick. So yeah, I think just given that um, we are now kind of you know moving our focus towards you know trying to prevent severity of illness rather than trying to stop the transmission, which we have failed to do. I think it would be wise to, you know, abandon the, the, those um, workplace, uh, you know, logs, so to speak. 
Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Kalonji, uh, from your point of view, you, you've seen the questions in the question and answer box um, and you've answered some of them there. What are some of the questions that you've seen and based on the discussions of your two colleagues as well, um, are the sort of key take home messages that you want to share with the uh, audience here in our webinar? Dr. Kalonji, if you could open your microphone. There we go, um, please proceed. You. Um, I think one of the questions that I saw was what stage is South Africa in um, regarding the immunization program? And um, I think after what uh, Prof discussed is the, the fact that we're probably still in vaccine coverage because the vaccine coverage is still quite low, which um, on that graph is around a stage two. Um, and then there's also mixed feelings about vaccines in terms of the public um, opinion. So, you know, I would think that we were probably between a stage two and three in terms of vaccine. Um, there were some questions about innate and uh, adaptive um, immunity, if there were studies um, that looked at it. And what I did find is that I did look it up and found that there are studies that were specific to innate and adaptive immunity. And I've just put the links um, in the chat for any of for anyone who's interested in, um, in looking at those questions. But um, I do agree with both of um, the panelists that we should actually be so focusing on the severity. We've had a few cases at work and every time we did a bit of an outbreak investigation and we looked at the logs and the temperatures and the temperatures were normal, the logs said no symptoms because it either happens over the weekend or people feel unwell at, in the evening and by then they've already been at work through the entire, the entire day. So um, stopping the um, transmission of infections has actually been quite difficult, um, but I do agree that maybe the, the focus should be on the the severity of um, disease rather. Thank you. Thank you for that. If any of you want to jump in, in there, please uh, just open your microphone and proceed. Um, if you could uh, repost yeah. those links. Go ahead, Prof. I mean, I'm going to jump in and I, fortunately I need to drop off in two minutes. And I think I owe it to Jonathan Erickson, uh, who's posted a whole lot of comments. And I don't want to come across as pretending that we've not seen those comments and I'm going to respond to it. And it's really unfortunate in this day and age, we caught, caught people still claiming vaccines to be experimental vaccines, which is complete rubbish. So I'm not even gonna to try to respond to that. The amount of efficacy and safety data that's been generated on vaccines and the fact that it is licensed in a number of countries doesn't make it experimental. A vaccinated employees, even in the present context of, uh, of, uh, of high force of past infection, are not equally as infectious as unvaccinated colleagues. Unfortunately, you might have missed the last part of my presentation, which clearly indicated that hybrid immunity is much more potent and actually more able to protect people against infection, resulting in them being less infectious. So even in settings where there's been a high force of past infection, vaccinated employees are less likely to transmit the virus than an unvaccinated individual. Uh, when it comes to the next question, vaccines have not been proven to be as effective as originally thought. Uh, we need to stop manipulating wording. Vaccines were not as effective against, against Omicron compared against a, a wild type virus because the vaccines were actually developed against a wild type virus. So we don't expect it to be equally effective against variants which have become antibody evasive. But as has been shown by the data, these vaccines perform, perform phenomenally well when it comes to protecting against severe disease and death, which is what matters most. In addition to which, the whole issue of side effects of vaccines, which have laid bare recently, clearly demonstrates a complete inability to understand the difference between what an adverse event, which is any medical event that occurs after a person has been vaccinated, irrespective of what the cause of that medical event is, as opposed to a side effect, which is a confirmation that the adverse event was a consequence of vaccination. What was released by the FDA was a whole listing of adverse events and not side effects of vaccines. So again, poor understanding of what was actually released in the public domain. The CDC decided against the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because it's spoiled for choice. The chances of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine causing severe adverse events, serious adverse events, is in a region of one out of every 250,000. The chances of dying of a lightning strike in South Africa is higher than the chances of dying of a serious adverse event due to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, Gates did not say that South Africa and other African countries have reached herd immunity. Herd immunity is a concept that I said uh, nine months ago we should stop speaking about because it's never going to materialize in South Africa. What Gates said recently 
is that countries in our African continent have had a high force of past infection and consequently they've developed high levels of protection against severe disease and death. Reports of side effects met with disdain and ridicule. Yes, we're not talking of side effects and the reports of the adverse events being attributed to vaccines when they're not should be met with disdain and ridicule. So with all respect to Jonathan Erickson, I think if you're wanting to deal with these issues, then you're needing to deal with these issues in a scientific manner, rather than rehashing a whole lot of misinformation that comes from social media. Thank you very but much for that, Prof. For that, I'm going to need to sign off. I've got another call now. Yes, thank you very much for joining us today. And so uh, as we are in the last minute or two of this webinar, um, uh, over to Dr. Kalonji and Dr. Um, Tembo. Your final comments, um, you know, we, we're talking about COVID-19 vaccines in the workplace. We've seen the importance of science. We've seen the importance of speedily sharing knowledge, um, you know, and, and, um, and, and, and uh, expediting the, the results that may not have yet been fully published in the proper sense, but is made available um, and can be um, considered by the experts in the different countries. I mean, I regard our three guests as experts, and so uh, our last two experts online. Um, what are your take-home messages to our audience, particularly those who are responsible for ensuring that our workplaces remain safe places, that you know, prevention within the workplace and workplace preparedness around potentially future uh, issues around biological hazards, viruses, and so on, um, pandemics of this nature. Over to you. Dr. Longi, I'll start with you. I see um, that you are visible and your microphone, if you could open that, and then I'll end with Dr. Tembo. Um, thank you again. Um, now, obviously, my workplace is a little bit different because we're right in the middle of clinical trials, and so, and we do COVID trials, so we do get information a little bit earlier, but we do focus on clear communication with our staff, that is what's very important, we always talk about risk versus benefits, as soon as there are guidelines that are out there, we communicate, but what we also make sure is that we follow the science, we follow the evidence, I think experts are experts for a reason. And, and for us, that is actually quite important. I tell people, you wouldn't take your car to uh, your neighbor, you would take it to a leadership. I, to, uh, you know, I think it's the same thing when it comes to the science around COVID-19 uh, COVID vaccines. Um, we follow the policies as much as, as we can, and we make the changes when is required. But what's really important is that we do focus on the evidence. If we need to move on looking at severity, then that is what we would do, and we try to be as compliant as uh, possible. But again, we work with COVID every single day. Um, so our situation may be a little bit different to an environment where it's maybe corporate and not part of the research environment. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And then um, Dr. Kalonji, your side. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I think um, for employees, I think for employers rather, um, I think one of the things that COVID has taught us is really just the, the amount of effort and work and thought that we need to put into uh, ensuring that our, our workplaces are safe. And it's not just like your ergonomics and you know, the usual things. You're also thinking now about you know, communicable diseases and what is it that you have to ensure within your workspace you know, what measures do you have to put in within your workspace to ensure that, you know, something like this, um, you know, it, it, the, the, the fallout of something like this happening again is limited. Because this, this particular scenario, COVID-19 pandemic, was really a ticking time bomb. We knew that at some point, something like as big as this is going to happen. And, you know, because we haven't, we, we haven't put in systems in place, the likelihood that this will happen again is quite uh, huge. So I think, you know, um, I think even for the NIOH, you know, a lot of the thinking that goes around, um, you know, the regulations that are in place, you, you know, the, the, um, it, the, the, the processes in your workplace for occupation and health and safety really need to be tightened and, um, you know, as well as, you know, thinking about things like vaccines and how to uh, get your staff to be uh, more amenable to things like that. Um, yeah, thank you so much. 
Well, thank you very much. And before I thank our guest speakers and thank all those participants, we had about, I think, 940 people. At one point, I saw that number um, on this in this particular webinar, which is great for us Friday afternoon in particular. So you will see on the screen at the moment, I just want to check with colleagues, can you see the save the date there, um, Dr. Tembo, Dr. Kalonji, can you see that? Yes, yes. Oh, great. So I just want to bring everybody's attention to a very important centenary webinar where we will have reached the 100th uh, COVID-19 webinar since March 2020. It is scheduled for the 21st of April, as you'll see there, uh, starting at uh, 9.25 until approximately 10 to 3 in the afternoon. And we have quite a significant uh, uh, list of guests that we uh, will have um, um, on that particular day. And um, it's going to take me too long to now get that particular program for you to share, but we will be sending out the program once it's completely finalized. Um, it includes uh, the CEO of the NHLS, um, uh, including the executive director of the NIH, Dr. Spoh Halamono, and then it includes other uh, NHLS besides uh, Dr. Kami Chetty, the CEO of the NHLS, Professor Kolekum Lisana from the NHLS, and then Dr. Professor Salim Abdul Karim, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Ivan Ivanov of, of the World Health Organization, um, and then Dr. Barry Kisnasami, who's the chairperson of the COVID-19 Workstream Committee under the Department, National Department of Health. Um, we have a representative from the Department of Employment and Labor, as well as the DME, the mining one, uh, the mining sector. Um, and then we have other very important uh, guests, including academics like Professor Amajibe and Professor Rajan Naidu. I'm going to leave it at that. And on the next occasion, I will share more details of the program, but that's the save the date. You would probably by now have received this email from us if you're on our mailing list uh, on the 21st of March. Um, I'll stop sharing that now and then just say a big thanks to our, um, our, our uh, <clears throat> two uh, speakers that are remaining. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Dishiki um, Kalonji, who is a public health medicine specialist um, a CRS leader and principal investigator of the South African Medical Research Council's HPRU unit. Thank you very much, doctor, for making the time, preparing and coming to share your information with us today. And then uh, Dr. Yamanya Tembo, who you also see there on the screen, who dealt with COVID-19 workplace vaccination programs. Thanks for sharing all your practical experience there at Khrutsky Hospital in Cape Town. Um, and she's a public health medicine registrar at the University of Cape Town, in the, also uh, associated and uh, with the Western Cape Department of Health. Thank you very much, Dr. Dembo. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalonji. And in his absence to Professor Shabir Madi, who has raised very critical questions and, uh, yes, challenging us and challenging, obviously, as he says, um, the authorities to ensure that we sharpen our approach, we sharpen the strategy, and we sharpen the implementation of resources where it is most effective. I say thank you very much to all of you. Have an enjoyable weekend. We will only complete administration for this webinar on Monday. So do not expect any certificates and CPD links and so on uh, as soon uh, as my colleagues who provide support around this matters have left the building. So uh, take care and stay safe and enjoy your weekend. And we'll see you on the next webinar here at the NIH's COVID-19 webinar series. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks, goodbye. Thank you.